Hello, everybody, and welcome to Civilization VI. Today, I'm going to share some unknown tips and tricks. Slightly more advanced in nature, but like any strategy in Civilization VI, we'll start easy and work our way into it. A great approach to life as a whole. My name is Jumbo Pixel, and in this video, we'll be talking science, culture, and production overflows, city defense strategies, and more, including your relationship with other civilizations, whether it be warlike or perhaps more peaceful. Let's begin. First and foremost, I want to talk about specifically overflows. Now, many of you will know already that when you go to place down a district, like I'm doing here with this campus, it will remove the feature beneath it. Some features like forests provide production, wheat here will provide food. And when I send a worker to it, I can remove that feature and add that resource to my city. Chopping the wheat will add food, chopping a forest will add production, for example. It's a common strategy, particularly when it comes to placing down a wonder, for example. Here in this test game, I might want to place down this wonder. Oh, there's some wheat in the way. Never mind. I send the worker, chop the wheat, it'll add the food to my city, and then I can place the wonder down. This is a go-to strategy. It works better with production, perhaps, because you can queue up the production from chopping down a forest. It will stay and wait until you choose to place a wonder and move through to the next turn. That's fundamentally a really key strategy to providing extra production into your cities in Civilization VI and chopping out wonders faster. Like I say, this has been a go-to strategy for many players for a long time, and it may not be news to you, but it's important to preface the next part of the strategy. Did you know this also works with science and culture? The two resources carry over or overflow in the exact same way. The strategy here, of course, works a little bit differently. Instead of sending your workers to remove features from tiles, to queue up resources ahead of time so that you can make use of them for future productions, you're doing the same thing potentially with culture or with science. And what you'll see me do here in a minute is use it on my culture here, my civics tree. I'm gonna refuse researching anything and move through to the next turn. You can hit shift and enter to force the game to move through and prevent you from having to make those decisions. Some civilization games also in their settings have the ability to move through and end your turn without uh, being forced to choose these prompts. But if you wanna manually force it, press shift and enter, and you'll force your way through to the next turn. What players may not realize is that your culture that you're earning, in this case, I'm earning 5.9 per turn, carries through. Watch me as I do it again. You'll notice the turns that are required to research, say, early empire or military tradition are going down. That is because my culture is being stockpiled. This works exactly the same way for science. You might think, why would I want to do that? Why would I not just want to rush through and grab my civics? Or why would I not just want to rush through and grab my next technology? In general, the strategy here is largely based, I believe, around the Eurekas. When you get a Eureka, you are significantly reducing the cultural cost for a civic, or the scientific cost for a technology. What you can therefore do is stockpile your early culture or science. You could do this at any point in the game, of course, but it is perhaps most notable in the early game. Stockpile it up, shift enter to move through and end your turns. And then once you're able to unlock a Eureka, whether it's from meeting a certain number of civilizations, building a certain number of districts, uh, clearing a barbarian outpost, whatever it may be, here I've got an inspiration for what is at this point granted a relatively cheap civic, but it highlights the point exactly as intended. The cost now has been halved or reduced by the Eureka bonus, and that means that my production, or in this case my culture, because that's the resource that I'm choosing to carry over, is essentially providing twice the value. Use this as you will. I would highly highly recommend, particularly if you're a player focused on Eurekas and Civics and trying to work towards those extra bonuses, that you shift into through a few turns, stockpile your extra science or culture, and then make much better use of it down the line. Now let's talk scouting and your relationship with other civilizations. Many of you will already know the benefits of producing scouts in the early game. They have advanced movement, advanced vision, you can find and seek out city-states first to get better bonuses from being the first player to meet them. Or alternatively, you could choose to send your scouts to find better city settling locations, wonders, you name it, they've got it, let's talk. They are brilliant at doing what they are designed to do. Scout. Go figure. However, 
there's a little bit more to unpack here. The scouts have some other features that may be less known to you as a player. Most notably, and when it comes to building relationships with other civilizations or other players, there's a little function in the game that measures your relationship. And a lot of the times, as you can see, the reasons for your current relationship may be unknown, especially in the early game where diplomatic visibility might not be your thing because you're still walking around like a bit of a Neanderthal. One important piece of information to note with the scouts is that when you meet a player with a scout, you will receive a positive boost, a plus two to your relationship. Other players and other civs can modify this, so do bear that in mind. A particularly aggressive opponent or Byzantium or what have you may have different modifiers here. But the crucial thing to note, and this makes sense when you think about it, is that scouts are a better diplomatic party than your early warriors. Your early warriors will be grunting and shaking their clubs at your opponent, whereas the scout comes forward in a little bit more of a peaceful way. And your opponents or potentially future friends will like that, and that will benefit your relationship. Moving down the line, of course, and getting off to a good start even is very important for loads of reasons. But to name a few, you might be interested in getting better trade deals or better alliances. This will naturally help you peaceful players, but also some aggressive players might stand to benefit from this too. Of course, you could use that alliance to leverage an opponent's or friend's military strength against an opponent and then do the old backstab maneuver and take both of them down. Alternatively, though, it may be easier for you in future to barter, to get better deals out of the AI, and it'll free up your warriors to do what they do best. Send your scouts out as diplomatic parties, you can think of them almost as envoys, if you will, to go out and meet players so that you can keep your warriors on hand to defend settlers like I'm doing here as I take my settler out of Lisbon, or of course defend against marauding barbarians who might be coming to pillage your lands. You will have seen some footage of that, unfortunately, already in this gameplay. The other thing to note, of course, about your scouts here is that visibility is key. And it's not just that diplomatic visibility for improving relationships, but also eyeing up opportunities. Cities that are weak, potentially like Istanbul, or a settler that in this case is an undefended, but could very well be. I'd like to now move on, actually, and this is a great segue into sharing some tips around city defense, around early wars and unit promotions. So let's discuss those now. And seeing a situation like this might really tempt you to jump in and declare an offensive war against the AI. And I want to talk about AI war behavior because this matters. When the AI has an offensive war declared against it, it will be more likely to try and defend its own borders. If you see a massive army coming towards your land, you could choose to declare war on the AI preemptively. That will put it, instead of in an offensive mindset where it's gunning for your cities, it'll put it on the back foot, it'll shift its mindset, and it'll force the AI to defend rather than go on the offense. This can be really good for you if you'd like to distract the AI and pull forces away from your cities, but it also matters when you are the aggressor, like I could be in the situation right here. When you trigger an aggressive war, providing you can at the very least defend your cities, or in this case, you're far enough away, it is simply a 10 turn equation. When you declare an offensive war, you have 10 turns. If you can survive those 10 turns and not take too much damage in the process to at least defend your cities, the AI will then sue for white peace. Again, this relates back to the AI's warfare mentality. If it's declared war on you and it's going for an aggressive war, it will be gunning for your cities and those will be the priorities. If you're the aggressor, then the AI is in the defensive mindset that will change its behaviors, force it to be much more defensive. And if you can hold on, for at least 10 turns, you will be able to push for white peace and hopefully you've at least managed to snag a couple of useful units or workers in the process. Maybe you've also used this time to weaken or take out their armies as well. Whether you're on the defensive because you've started an offensive or simply you're playing on deity and the AI just can't let up and it's sending units at you like there's no tomorrow, a few defensive city tips could be useful for you. First and foremost, you should note that, of course, walls will be your greatest friend. You need them for city defense. This is unlikely new to many of you. It will also, of course, enable your city to fight back. Unlike in previous Civ games, you'll need those walls built before you can launch an attack directly from the city. However, there are some other nuances here. 
uh, each district that you build, not just defensive ones, but campuses, industrial sites, holy sites, you name it, will add to the defensive strength of a city. It's good to know in the back of your mind, I think, and many players forget that, or they didn't even know it to begin with. Another thing that I would say here, and this is a reasonably reliable go-to strategy, but I really think it's important to bring it home to round out this part of advice and these tips. Archers are your friends, especially if you've had to trigger an offensive-defensive scenario like we discussed earlier, I would highly recommend two archers in every city, even if you don't quite have those districts' defenses online. The archers are your greatest allies. You can, of course, also use them on the offensive attack from afar. They are by far and away one of the best units in the game for their class and their time, i.e. when you unlock them. Their strength to production or cost ratio is fantastic, and they will always be brilliant defenders, whether it's against marauding barbarians or an aggressive AI. The other thing to note, of course, is unit promotions. As you start to defend or offend, you'll earn promotions for your units. Some of them are fairly straightforward. Take the scouts here, for example. You could move along the left side and get better movement in woods, see through woods, extra sight range. On the right-hand side of its promotions, you have faster movement on hills, can move after attacking, and extra combat strength. You can see there's a a relative theming bonus to each side. Sometimes it's stronger and more noticeable than others. Here is the Archer's promotion line. Why I'm bringing this up is because when you move into the later game and you start to be able to combine your units into army corps or what have you, these promotions matter. I suggest promoting one unit, let's say Archer's, along the left side. Then promote your second Archer along the right hand side. When you merge them together later in the game, you'll create a super unit, a Frankenstein's monster, if you will, but with all of the right pieces. It will share their promotions rather than cancelling them out, and your end unit will have all of them, thanks to some clever planning earlier on. Thank you very much for watching this Civilization VI video. I hope you learned something. If you'd like to share your tips below, I would really appreciate it. There are always lots of nuances to Civilization VI, extra tips and features, particularly some of these more advanced or unknown ones. So do share your knowledge below. The hive mind is always stronger than an individual on their own. My name has been Jumbo Pixel. Thank you so much for joining me. If you would care to like the video, it would probably help it out a lot. And I'll see you next time.